This is lecture three in Neuro uh, 3272 at the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland. Um, to get to our more advanced topics in social neuroscience, we're first going to need to cover some foundations of neuroscience. So in the next four lectures, we will cover the nervous and endocrine systems in detail, including how the two systems interact. I appreciate that a lot of you watching this probably already know a lot about the nervous system and you've covered it in other courses if you're, instance, you're a psychology student. Um, so you probably know this stuff pretty well, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page when we get to our later lecture, so that's why I'm going over this material now. For those of you who might find that their previous coverage of this and their remembrance of that stuff is sort of sketchy, I highly recommend that you refer to the appendix chapters in the Sapolsky book, where he goes, goes over these two systems in great detail and much fuller explanations. And they're actually very well written, so please read those chapters from the appendix. All right, in this lecture, what I'm gonna do is introduce the nervous system, and then we'll talk about the neuron as the basis of the nervous system. We'll talk about communication between neurons, neurotransmitters, and then some on the organization of the neurons, including the difference between the central and the peripheral nervous system, and then finally in the peripheral nervous system, we'll drill down and look at the somatic and autonomic nervous system. In the next lecture, we'll talk more about the brain and the spinal cord and specifically focus on what you need to know about the brain and relevant to social behavior. Okay, as an introduction to the nervous system, let's talk about a very old concept now known as the neuron doctrine. And this is the idea that the nervous system is made up of special cells and the special cell is the neuron, or if you prefer the British spelling and pronunciation, the neuron. Um, I'll you be using the American spelling and pronunciation. Um, the problem of showing that the nervous system was actually made up of the special cells is that the neurons themselves are hard to see. Most neurons are in the range of 0.01 to 0.05 millimeters in diameter. And so what this required in order for scientists to even know that neurons were there is first of all, you would need a compound microscope that wasn't developed until the late 1600s. Then you would need thin slices of the brain for, to look that through the microscope. And to do this properly, you really need this field of histology that was born in the early 1800s. And then finally, the other thing that was really important to see neurons was to have staining techniques in histology, where you could stain different kinds of cells and see them clearly and how they were separated from each other. And this wasn't developed until the late 1800s. So by the end of the 19th century, there were sort of two camps. And one camp believed in the neuron doctrine, that they believed that there were these specific neurons that made up the nervous system and that they didn't actually touch each other. And they had, um, they sort of independently communicated to each other across little gaps. The other group of scientists who looked at neurons thought when they looked through their microscopes that the neurons actually were all touching and forming sort of like a super neuron, where all the neurons would, during their fetal development, kind of grow together and become sort of a, a blob. And one of those people who in that latter camp was one of the important uh, developers of these staining techniques, and that was Camillo Golgi. Golgi in 1873 developed what is now known as the Golgi stain by soaking brain tissue in silver chromate solution. Golgi believed in, in these super neurons that touched one another during field development. So he was a strong believer that the neuro nervous system is actually made up of these super neurons where all these neurons connect and touch each other. The opposing sort of view, the one that believed in the neuron doctrine, was this Cajal. And Cajal used those Golgi stains to show that neurons actually were not continuous with one another and that they must communicate, um, not, uh, they must communicate by contact, not continuity. That is, something was being passed between them from one neuron to the next. And the way he was able to use this Golgi stain was that the Golgi stain allowed you to stain one neuron without staining the next neuron. And with your careful um, staining techniques and looking through the microscope and using these thin slices of the brain, Cajal was able to identify how the neurons were actually separate from one another. And he made many beautiful drawings of, of these um, neurons. And here's one of those examples of his drawings of looking at neurons after he had stained them. Now, interestingly, Golgi and Cajal, even though they disagreed about the neuron doctrine, they ended up sharing the Nobel Prize in 1906. 
And there's a little story in Sapolsky's book about the fact that these two didn't even speak to each other because the funny thing here was that Cajal used Golgi's invention, the Golgi stain, to actually show proof for the neuron doctrine, much to Golgi's chagrin. Now the neuron itself, let's go ahead and talk about that next. The neuron, and by the way, here's another one of uh, Cajal's drawings of neurons. I interestingly, I was seeing an article, I read an article about the fact that all the drawings of Cajal have this little blue circle, the stamp on them. And it's because the person who collected all of these, the curator of the museum in Madrid, who took all of Cajal's drawings, um, put a little blue stamp right in the middle of every one of them so that um, they wouldn't be forged and taken away. And so now it's impossible to actually see one of Cajal's drawings without this little blue stamp in the middle. Um, but anyway, that's one of the ways you can tell it's an actual Cajal uh, drawing is because of this blue stamp that this one curator uh, put in. But anyway, what do we know about neurons? Well, there are about 100 billion neurons in the human brain. And each neuron has about 10,000 dendritic spines. And we're going to talk about what a dendrite is in a moment. But this means then that at the receiving end of each neuron, there's 10,000 different little bits sticking out from each neuron that could collect information from the neurons that are nearby. And on the other end of the neuron, where the neuron releases its information to the next neuron, there could be up to 10,000 axon terminals. So when you kind of think about all these neurons next to each other, that means that you could have actually in the brain about a million, uh, sorry, 1,000 trillion connections in your brain. And you can see that's actually a quadrillion connections in your brain that you could be making between all of these different neurons with all their different spines and axon terminals. So what is the function of the neurons? Well, the neurons basically communicate information across the body. And they do this kind of following this pathway of going from the brain to the spinal cord out to the body. And then the body gives information back to the spinal cord and the spinal cord passes it up to the brain and it continues on and on and on. This is what's happening constantly across the nervous system. A little bit of terminology here. Um, afferent neurons are those neurons that are bringing information to a structure in the body. So if you're taking that pathway of neurons that's going from the brain or the spinal cord out to a body, those kinds of neurons are known as afferent, that begin with the letter A. That means you're going to the structure in the body. Efferent neurons are those neurons that are bringing information away from the structure. So things that are coming from some part of the body and going back towards the brain would be an efferent neuron. We also have neurons that have their cells and axons entirely within the structure, within a spinal cord or within the brain. And those are called interneurons or intrinsic neurons. Okay, so a little bit terminology there. We'll have some more coming up. Now let's take the neuron itself. And you probably have seen this kind of drawing before, the major parts of the neuron. We'll start with the dendrites. Remember I told you there could be up to 10,000 dendrites on a single neuron. So this is a very simplified view of the neuron, each, I'm sorry, yeah, of a neuron. And you can see that the dendrite there has a few little branches. It's those little branches, each teeny branch there is a dendritic spine. And I'm saying there could be up to 10,000 of those dendritic spines on a single neuron. Over on the far right, you can see that the axon ends with this thing called the axon terminal, and it has a structure that looks very similar to a dendrite, these little branches, and each little branch is an axon terminal. And as I said, there could be up to 10,000 of those axon terminals in a single neuron. But flowing from the left to the right, the information is gonna come in from the dendrite, pass along there through the cell body, which is where the nucleus is. The nucleus contains the DNA. The cell body also contains all of the um, necessary parts of the, of the neuron to keep it alive, to keep it functioning. And then we see that where the cell body ends and it kind of connects to this axon is what's known as the axon hillock. And then we have these axons that can go on for a long distance or a very short distance. And at the end of the axon, we have the axon terminals. So how does the neuron pass on this information? Well, it does this through excitation and inhibition of pulses that it can pass along itself. So from an informational standpoint, this is just sort of like an information theory, from the dendritic spines down to the axon hillock, what's really happening in terms of information is sort of like an analog signal in the sense that different gradations of the signal that, that the dendrite is picking up can change over space and time. So that is different dendritic spines are picking up different activations or inhibitions and the kind of summation of that time and where those, those different dendrites are firing 
could cause the neuron to actually fire. And at that point where it fires, the axon hillock to the axon terminals, it's really a digital signal. That is, it just goes on or off, causing the axon terminals to signal to the next neuron or not. So what I'm trying to say is it's interesting that from one half of that neuron or the part up to the axon hillock, it's really something that can vary and change. But once it reaches a certain cutoff or a certain criterion, it's gonna fire or not along the axon. And the axon is just an all or none um, uh, signal or message. How does it all do this? Well, this is very, again, very quick, um, a quick review, but basically in the nerve, we have this um, neuronal membrane and inside the neuro in neuron, we have intracellular fluid and outside the neuron, we have extracellular space. And this membrane is basically causing a, an electrical gradient to exist between the inside and the outside of the cell thanks to that membrane. And why that is, is that we have different positively charged and negatively charged ions outside and inside the um, um, neuron. And where they're sitting causes an electrical gradient to occur. So what you can see here is I'm showing that we have potassium ions on the inside in the intracellular fluid at rest. On the outside, we have a lot of sodium ions that are sitting out there in the extracellular space. And at rest, the resting potential, what you would see if you stuck a, um, a little electrode into the actual axon, for example, where we are, we would see that when nothing is really happening here, there's a electrical gradient of 70 millivolts, that the inside is more negative than the outside. And then what would happen is that channels are going to open up and close, letting the potassium and the sodium ions move in and out of the cell. But normally at rest, these sodium gates are closed. And so the sodium can't come in. And that's what's causing this not to sort of just neutralize where you get equal numbers of potassium and sodium ions on either side. There's a pump, the sodium potassium pump. And then what this does is it actually pumps sodium is out out of the cell and it'll kind of um, when it needs to get rid of sodium it'll do this by pumping them out that does require energy so that the neuron just like any other cell is using up energy and it's going to need a source of energy to keep it going but all that happens when this change happens is what's going to happen when we have a um, nerve impulse when something happens but so far i'm just describing what it's like at rest everything is just sort of even there we pumped some of the sodium out, we've closed the channels, and nothing's really happening except that we have a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts. Now, if we get enough of a change, enough of an excitation from the dendrites, there'll be a place there at the axon hillock where an action potential could begin. And that action potential then is where we really finally have our nerve impulse if it's going to happen. So what we see here is that the membrane's potential at the axon hillock, hillock is gonna go from negative, from minus 70 millivolts, up to something positive when an action potential occurs. So here what we're showing is when the potential reaches a less negative threshold, so like it's not as down as minus 70, but it's up maybe up to minus 55, the sodium gates will actually open. And when the sodium gates open, this will allow sodium ions to enter. And as they enter, they quickly change what happens in the cell. Um, and we're gonna get this action potential. So right at the point of the axon hillock, if it's got some reason to go from minus 70 to minus 55 millivolts because it was stimulated by what was happening at the dendrites, it will cause right at that place of the axon hillock that these channels will open up and sodium starts to flow in. Then what happens is as the sodium flows in, we get a change in the overall electrical gradient and we end up getting a more positive charge, a plus 50 millivolts here. And the sodium gates close and the potassium gates open, causing the potassium to leave the cell as the sodium rushes in. And then what happens after we reach that peak, the po as the po potassium leaves the cell, the potential becomes less positive and eventually hyperpolarized. So as the potassium leaves the cell, the potential is becoming less positive and eventually it's all gonna become hyperpolarized. It's gonna go back down to the negative. So it's actually less than the original minus 70 millivolts. And now that we have a lot of potassium on the outside and we have um, sodium on the inside, that's when the pump's gonna happen, the sodium potassium pump's gonna happen, where it's going to let the um, potassium back into the cell and the sodium's gonna be pumped out through those um, pumps. And as it does that, we'll go back to the resting um, potential of minus 70 volts.
sorry, 70 millivolts. So you can see that that all happened very quickly. You get this little change and it's happening from that place of the axon hillock and it's gonna to continue to happen all along the axon to the end, to the axon terminals. So as I said, from the axon hillock onwards, it's basically an all or none law. If the threshold for, of excitation is met or exceeded, the action potential is going to occur. And once it occurs, it can't stop. But if the threshold is not met, like there's not enough activation coming in from the dendrites, the actual potential will never occur. So you could actually have a neuron that's sort of like throbbingly ready to go because it's getting a bunch of um, um, you know, different impulses from the dendrites that it wants to fire, but it has to reach that cutoff, that threshold in order for anything to happen. And without that happening, there'll be no action potential at the axon hillock. So there's no in-between potential. The action potential is always the same size, amplitude, and velocity. It follows exactly the pattern that I just showed you. So again, it begins at the axon hillock. That's where you're gonna see this change of the sodium and potassium gates. And then as it starts to form and it goes down next to it, it's gonna cause the neighboring cell, a neighboring part of the membrane to keep doing the same thing. So what this is trying to show you is the propagation of the action potential. So as it starts at the axon hillock, right next to it, the next part of that membrane are gonna be some other gates that open and close. And then the ne next to them, it's some other gates open and close and so on, all the way down along the entire axon, we keep getting this change of sodium and potassium going in and out causing this depolarization and then resting and repolarization and so on. And so as that happens, it moves along here, the signal is turning on and off all the way along the, ax the axon. And then when it gets to the end, to the axon terminal, we're going to, again, have a change. So the action potential is thus regenerated due to the sodium ions moving down the axon, depolarizing the adjacent areas of the membrane. There are these refractory periods that we don't have to get into yet here, but basically a refractory period is, is where at that membrane um, it won't change. So there's like a, a little bit of time out after an action potential fires where the part of the membrane where the action potential just went through can't fire again. And that happens in a, very, in a good way in the sense that you cannot have then action potentials going back off in the opposite direction toward the axon hillock. So it's sort of like they go to their resting potential and they say time out, not gonna be able to fire for a millisecond or two. And just enough of that not firing means that only the thing that is gonna fire is the next part of the membrane that's just still sitting there and, and is ready to go. And so that's why it propagates further along the axon. You can actually speed up the propagation, or I should say the neurons do this, and they do this with a myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath that's along the axon speeds up propagation. When the action potential reaches what's called a node of Ranvier, Sodium ions enter the axon, pushing a chain of positive ions along the axon to the next node, which fires, etc. And because of this myelin sheaf, it sort of like speeds everything along, making it faster than if you had to have every single point along the axon to fire. So this is basically a way to make the um, action potential go along that long, potentially long axon much more quickly than it would ordinarily do. So that's it in a nutshell, how action potentials go. And again, I'm hoping that you've run into this before. And again, if you need some more, um, some more background on this, you can read Appendix A in, uh, or the first chapter in the appendix of, of um, Sapolsky's book. But let's move on to the next topic today, for which is, which is, and I want to talk a little bit about the communication between the neurons. So, so far I've just been saying how the dendrites got excited and then they move their signal all the way down to the axon terminals and at the axon terminals, they're gonna release a signal. So what's actually happening there in those spaces between the neurons? The spaces between the neurons are known as the synaptic cleft. And so what I've tried to show here in this picture is the thing up on the top would be where the action terminal, ax, the action potential, sorry, the action terminals, sorry, the axon terminals are ending. And so that's called the presynaptic neuron. So there's a neuron up there and it has a whole bunch of different branches, up to 10,000 of these um, axon uh, terminals. And so there at one of those terminals, you can see the terminal buttons are transmitting um, neurons. So they're going to release and open up these little vesicles and this chemical neurotransmitter gets out there into the synaptic cleft. And then in the dendrite of the receiving neuron or the postsynaptic neuron, 
you can see that that dendrite um, has little places that are receptor sites that can take in the neurotransmitter. And if it fits, it's like a lock and key sort of mechanism here, that neurotransmitter can actually fit into that receptor site. It is going to possibly cause the dendrite then to fire, or perhaps it causes the dendrite not to fire. It can be an inhibitory function. So those little neurotransmitters are being released there at the synaptic cleft. There's, uh, we'll talk about this in a couple lectures from now, but there's a lot of regulation that's going on there in the synaptic cleft. The presynaptic neuron can actually take back in um, some of the neurotransmitters. It also is, um, can pay attention to how much of the neurotransmitter is being released out in the synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap. So there's a lot of regulation that just happens right there. But of course, this is all happening in just milliseconds. It's happening very, very quickly. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those neurotransmitters, those things that are being released there by each axon terminal. So the neurotransmitters themselves are, of course, made by the neuron. So the neuron, of all the things it's already doing, it's also producing neurotransmitters. And it does this by some of the neurotransmitters are actually created back in the soma, in the cell body. And these would include neurotransmitters that are known as peptide neurotransmitters. So peptide neurotransmitters are made up in the cell body and then they're transported along the axon um, you know, during times of rest when things are going on. They're actually pushed down there and they're waiting then in all of those different um, axon terminals. Other neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine are actually manufactured right at the axon terminal by the neuron. So it just depends what that neuron's doing, what its neurotransmitter is supposed to be based on its DNA code that's in its cell body, um, where the neurotransmitters can be made and what kind of neurotransmitter it is. So what is a neurotransmitter? It's, it's a chemical released by one neuron at the synapse that affects another neuron. And note that a chemical released into the bloodstream and that affects many neurons all over the body is called a hormone. So that's why we're going to be covering the endocrine system. And it turns out that some of these chemicals are both neurotransmitters and hormones. So for example, epinephrine, or also it's known as adrenaline, is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. Now the human brain has a few hundred different types of neurotransmitters, and there are probably still some to be discovered yet. So we have many, many different kinds of neurotransmitters. The transmitter, neurotransmitters themselves have three major effects. One kind of effect that a neurotransmitter could have is what's known as an inhibitory effect. And this means then when the dendrites of the receiving neuron receive that neurotransmitter, it decreases the likelihood that that postsynaptic neuron is going to fire. So you remember I was talking about how between the dendrite uh, um, if, yeah, between the dendrites and the axon hillock, it's sort of like an analog signal. And what I'm saying there is that the um, input from these different uh, ax axon, potent axon terminals that are releasing their neurotransmitters could be that overall, the dendrite's getting the message to inhibit, don't fire. And it will cause then it not to actually reach the action potential or cause an action potential to be formed at the axon hillock. Other neurons, or sorry, other neurotransmitters, of course, also are known as excitatory, and they increase the likelihood that the postsynaptic neuron will fire. So among those 10,000 different dendritic spines, if they're receiving a lot, a lot of neurotransmitters that are excitatory, that summation of all of that information coming from all those dendritic spines is going to reach the axon hillock and possibly cause it then to go ahead and fire. A third type of effect that we don't talk as much about in um, neuroscience, but is really quite important, is a genomic effect of neurotransmitters. And basically what this means is that when the neuron receives uh, in, at the dendrite one of these neurotransmitters, it could cause a DNA transcription to happen in the soma, where it might, for instance, cause more receptors to be formed. So the genomic effect here could be that when it receives a certain amount of input from a, a presynaptic neuron, it's going to end up building more receptors in the dendrite. So that means that the dendrite would become more receptive to that kind of neurotransmitter. So this is kind of a little sneaky way that neurotransmitters can change things. So they're not only just changing things in the firing of action potentials, they could also change the receptivity of neurons depending on whether or not they have these genomic effects. So neurotransmitters are quite fascinating.
And you can imagine then why so many people are interested in them and why there's so much neuroscience devoted to the discussion of neurotransmitters. Now in our course, we're gonna talk about some a small set of these neurotransmitters. And so I wanna go ahead and just list some major neurotransmitters that you should learn and just a little bit about what their functions are. So one transmitter, a neurotransmitter to pay attention to is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's primarily released at muscles. And this will be you'll, something I'll be talking about in a future lecture where you can actually see that a neurotransmitter will be released at a, mus a muscle um, motor end plate. And at that particular place, if there's getting enough of the acetylcholine, it'll cause the muscle to fire its own action potential and cause the muscle to contract and make a movement. But it also is involved in the brain in learning. Um, so acetylcholine is quite an important neurotransmitter. Serotonin, you're sure you've heard about that one. It's involved in mood, sleep, arousal, aggression, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, alcoholism. So lots of different kinds of behaviors are gonna be involved with serotonin. Dopamine, this would be involved in movement, producing feelings of pleasure when released by the brain's reward system. And it's also involved in learning. Then we have epinephrine. That's a stress hormone, but it also plays a minor role as a neurotransmitter. So we'll be talking about epinephrine from time to time. And then neuroepinephrine, which is another hormone that's released during stress, but it's also a neurotransmitter that can increase arousal and attentiveness. Then there's GABA. GABA is predominantly an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Its receptors respond to alcohol and some tranquilizers. If you have a deficiency in GABA receptors, it could be a cause of epilepsy. And lastly, I have glutamate. Glutamate is a, is a principal excitatory transmitter. It's involved in learning. It also seems to be implicated in schizophrenia. So these are the, some of the major transmitters and some of the ones that I'd like you to pay attention to and know about because they'll come up again from time to time. And this is because certain tracts in the brain will be known for having a particular neurotransmitter being highly prominent in that particular track. And so it could be that there'll be some particular behavior that's largely involved in a part of the brain. And that part of the brain is largely features one of these neurotransmitters. And so what psychopharmacology could do is perhaps give a drug that affects the levels of that neurotransmitter being out there in the synaptic cleft and therefore regulate or change a person's behavior as a result of it. So neurotransmitters, as I said, are created by the cell itself, and it's produced um, from chemicals that are coming from the person's diet. So it turns out that what you eat actually can affect the production of neurotransmitters, whether you have more or less of those particular neurotransmitters. Just as an example of like something you can eat that affect different neurotransmitters in your body would be tryptophan, which is a type of protein. It's present in most protein-based foods and dietary proteins. It's particularly plentiful in chocolate, oats, dried dates, milk, yogurt, cottage cheese, etc. And what it does when you have a lot of tryptophan in your system, it's going to cause more serotonin to be produced by those neurons that make neuro, that neurotransmitter. So your diet very much can affect the levels of neurotransmitters that you have. So it's not just psychopharmacology that affects our neurotransmitters, our diets affect. Um, what happens with our neurotransmitters. And just to say a little bit more about how those neurotransmitters get produced, as I said, some of the neurotransmitters are produced in the cell body or the soma, for example, peptide neurotransmitters. Others are produced at the axon terminals like acetylcholine, and that these are produced in the cell body, the, those that are produced back in the cell body like the peptide ones must be transported down the axon to the terminals at the rate of one to 100 millimeters a day. So it's a slow, movement of those um, of those neurotransmitters going from the soma back down to the axon terminals. And so you can see that again showing you in the picture on the left, that's a process that could take quite a, a lot of time as you're eating and changing your diet, infecting things and how those neurotransmitters are being created at the cells that make those particular neurotransmitters. Now when we get to the place in the presynaptic um, neuron, uh, when the action potential reaches that axon terminal, there's going to be a depolarization that happens that's, that could be sufficient to open in calcium gates that let calcium flow into the terminal. And as the calcium flows in, it causes the neuron to excrete the neurotransmitters. And this is called exocytosis.
This all happens in one or two milliseconds. So it's a very, very fast process. The neurotransmitter then enters the synaptic cleft where it can bond with a postsynaptic neuron. So that's basically how these neurons are communicating with each other. Now let's move on to a higher level of organization with the neurons and talk about just how the neurons themselves are organized in the body. We can talk about this in terms of the two large branches of the nervous system, which is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is pretty much everywhere else. Some terminology that's sort of confusing when you read neuroscience papers, it has to do with the distinction whether or not we're talking about the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. So for instance, if you have a cluster of neuronal cell bodies, so you have the, the cell bodies themselves of a whole bunch of neurons, Confusingly, in the central nervous system, they'll call this a nucleus. So even though each neuron has a nucleus in it, a collection of neuron cell bodies is also known as a nucleus in the CNS. In the PNS, this is known as a ganglion, or if you've got several ganglion, you talk about a ganglia. But the PNS uses this different um, name for the same thing of a cluster of neuron cell bodies. It's called a ganglion. Similarly, when you have a cluster of axons, you know, these axons that go out like maybe in a bundle or all together someplace. In the CNS, it's known as a tract. So in the brain and the spinal cord, we talk about tracts. But if you're talking about a cluster of axons in the peripheral nervous system, it's known as a nerve. And so when you've heard people talk about your nerves, you're always talking about clusters of axons that are out in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, with that in mind, Let's go back and talk a little bit more about how the central and the peripheral nervous system can differ. So you can see here on the left, I have the central nervous system broken down into the brain and the spinal cord, as I said. And we'll be saving the discussion of the brain and spinal cord for the next lecture. In the peripheral nervous system, we can break that down into the somatic and the autonomic nervous system, the SNS and the ANS. Before I go and talk a little bit more in detail about the somatic and the autonomic nervous systems, Let's just think a little bit though about how the CNS and the PNS, the central and the peripheral nervous systems work together. And this is a nice diagram that shows us. So you can see that everything that's in the colored boxes is the peripheral nervous system. And what the peripheral nervous system can do is take in sensory input. So you've got sensory receptors that are responding to all sorts of external stimuli. They could be responding to sensory receptors in your skin, your muscles, and your joints. And they could also be sensory receptors that are in your internal organs. So as you get information from outside your body, what your muscles are doing, what's going on in your stomach, for instance, that sensory information is all being driven or taken by the peripheral nervous system up to the central nervous system, to the brain and the spinal cord, where things get sort of sorted out up there in the brain and, central, and the spinal cord. And then the brain and spinal cord could respond to that sensory input with what's called motor output, which means that it could go off to the somatic nervous system that would direct voluntary movements like need to flee, need to run, need to eat more food. Or it could be that it causes something to change in the autonomic nervous system where you get this involuntary bodily activity such as your heart rate and your breathing rate. And so perhaps it's the sensory inputs telling the central nervous system that it would be really good right now if the heart rate were to go down or to speed back up. And so that information has to be then processed through the brain and spinal cord and sent back down as a motor output to cause the heartbeat to go up or to breathing rate to change. And then you can see the autonomic nervous system, it's broken down into the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so again, they work very well together, the CNS and the PNS. It's just a, sort of a functional uh, break here that we're talking about and, and breaking them down separately. So let's go back to the peripheral nervous system and finish out this lecture by talking about uh, its parts. So one major part of the peripheral nervous system is the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system enables regulations of interaction with the external environment. So that's the main thing you wanna think about is the somatic nervous system is how we interact with the external environment. All our conscious awareness of the external environment and all of our motor activity to cope with it operate through the system. So all of everything that you're aware of, when you're aware of your physical feelings and uh, people touching you and um, hearing strange sounds, and then your response to that all is regulated by the somatic nervous system. It consists of nerves that are going to and from motor and sensory organs. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, um, and these are 
they have given names like the olfactory, the trigeminal, facial, and the vagus. So these are all nerves that have their cell bodies in the brain, okay, and then they go out to the periphery. And also we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves that have their cell bodies in the spinal cord. And again, you have both sensory and motor neurons there, um, and they go all along the spine, these 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So remember, again, I told you that nerve means axons in the peripheral nervous system. Again, what would be called in the brain is a tract, but here in the peripheral nervous system, we call these nerves. So you can have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and if you study medicine, you'll end up having to memorize all of those cranial and spinal nerves, but we won't be doing that in this course. Just to give you an example of how, for instance, these cranial nerves could affect something that might be social, you might remember from the last lecture that I talked about facial electromyography that measures our muscle contractions that we make when we make different facial expressions. And what is regulating or changing or making those muscles contract? Well, it's the facial nerve. So the facial nerve is one of these cranial nerves. Its cell bodies are in the pons in the brainstem. And what we basically are doing again is that somewhere in the central nervous system, some sort of signals being sent to the cell bodies of the facial nerve, causing them to be excited to cause you to maybe make a smile or to open your eyes wide or whatever it happens to be. And then likewise, you can get sensory neurons that tell you what your facial expression is. Like for instance, if you hold your um, lip corners back to make a smile, you're sending information back to your um, brainstem that is telling you that you're actually making a smile and that feedback could then be processed further by the central nervous system. Now, finally, let's look at the last branch here today that of the peripheral nervous system. That would be the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic because it's largely thought of to be automatic, the ANS. This enables regulations of, the inter of interactions with the internal environment. So this is more not about how you are responding to the external world. It's more about how your body is responding to things internally. And basically, the autonomic nervous system maintains homeostasis. It tries to keep the body's internal states within acceptable ranges most of the time. It's sort of considered more involuntary than the uh, somatic nervous system in the sense that, um, you know, somatic nervous system, you could be making, you could throw a ball at somebody, you could be running. Um, but in the autonomic nervous system, we don't really have much conscious control of what's happening in the autonomic nervous system. And then we have two branches of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branches. And these two branches are considered antagonistic. That is, they sort of do the opposite of each other. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system generally directs activities that expend energy. So things, parts of your body that are gonna have to use up a lot of energy tend to be regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. So for example, speeding up your heart rate is done by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system largely controls activities that don't require a lot of energy that are kind of quiet activities, for example, your digestion. And the easiest way to kind of see how the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems are antagonistic is to kind of look at it this way in this representation where we have the sympathetic system, para, sorry, parasympathetic on the left, the sympathetic on the right in this drawing. And you can see where their cell bodies are in the um, brain or in the spinal cord. And you can see, for example, that in the parasympathetic nervous system, we get things like it, if it's activated, you're gonna constrict the pupils, increase your saliva, reduce your heart rate, stimulate activities of the digestive system and so on. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system dilates your pupils, it inhibits saliva production, dilates the bronchia, rises the heart rate, inhibits the activity of the digestive systems and so on. So we have differences between the parasympathetic and sympathetic system that are ultimately gonna be regulated by your central nervous system that's gonna tell these two branches what to do, but they're giving information and keeping things automa automatic in, in terms of this sort of regulation, depending on what's going on. So a lot of the measures that we talked about in lecture two, a lot of the traditional psychophysiology measures, things like skin conductance and heart rate, are really measuring autonomic nervous system activity. And there's a lot of really interesting psychological and social correlates of what happens with the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system uh, because of this. All right, that's all I have for today. Um, I've then again covered um, the introduction here to the nervous system, what the neuron is, and the parts of the neuron, 
communication between the neurons, some of the major neurotransmitters and how they're created and how they get transported. And finally, we've started to talk about the organization of the nervous system, the central and peripheral nervous system, and then the peripheral nervous system was broken down to the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Now, again, at the next lecture, we're going to talk more about the brain and the spinal cord, and we'll be really focusing on much more about specific brain regions and some of the language that we use to talk about brain function. So thank you very much, and that's all I have for today's lecture.